So tonight what I wanted to do is um, cover basically three tips. The first tip is, is sort of HDR, but not really. If you're like a lot of us, you hate HDR, but you like the idea of it getting expanded tonal range in your images. So we're sort of in favor of realistic HDR, <laughs> if there is such a thing. Okay, so the deal here is, is particularly, now this is important to me, if you have a real good camera, if you've got a Nikon or a Canon, this doesn't apply to you. But if you're like the rest of us, you know, working with pieces of junk, then the, particularly with a small sensor, what happens is if you take a picture of a nice blue sky, you know, late four o'clock in the afternoon, bright blue sky, and you've got, you know, green uh, forest, and you've got a nice uh, lake underneath it, and some ducks swimming along on the lake, what happens is, if you set the exposure properly for the lake, the sky washes out because your little sensor camera not, doesn't have enough dynamic range to record the entire scene. Okay. Now, if you have the top of the line Nikon or Canon, which has, you know, what is it, 72 F stuffs worth of dynamic range or whatever, it's actually what, 14 or 12, somewhere in that range. It's, uh, you know, you don't have to, you, you, all your skies are blue, even on cloudy days. It's amazing how that works. Okay. But for the rest of us, this is an issue. So the idea here is, you know, HDR, I think we're all familiar with the technique. Basically, you shoot like five images or seven images, each one of them, one f-stop or two f-stops apart. And um, in a lot of the cameras now have a bracket mode you can put it into that will do that for you. Uh, either just hold the shutter down and fire away. Uh, and then the idea is we're going to use Photoshop's HDR program, basically because of all the HDR programs I've seen, it does the best at aligning images. Again, to do HDR properly, you would put the camera on a tripod with a remote release, and you would take a burst of seven images without moving the camera, and hopefully nothing in the scene moves. Uh, the reality is, you know, if you're like most of us, particularly with a little camera, we, don't, we never carry a tripod anymore. So we're hand-holding, you know, five or seven shots. You know, the first one looks like this, the second one, and they're bouncing all over the place. So we need to be able to align those images so that they, they stack over top of each other. And once we do that, and Photoshop's very, very good at doing that, once we do that, then the idea is we could run it through a regular HDR program. We could run it through Photoshop's HDR program. Or what I'm suggesting now is we simply let take the 32-bit image that's created by the HDR program or by Photoshop's HDR program, save out that 32-bit image as a TIFF, and then open it up in either Lightroom or Camera Raw and process it normally. And what you see is you have an incredible range. Those sliders in Lightroom and the sliders in Camera Raw, boy, they're, they've got a lot more range to play with if you're working on a 32-bit image instead of a 16 or an 8-bit image. So let me show you. So the, the process is pretty, pretty simple, actually. Uh, I'm going to go into the bridge, which is the thing I never use, by the way. But um, I'm using it tonight. And what I've got here is uh, uh, five images. And they probably didn't really need HDR to start with, but what the hell. So what we have is the way my camera works, if I put it in bracket mode, is I get a normal exposure. I get, uh, in this case, it's two stops underexposed. Uh, one stop underexposed, one stop overexposed, two stops overexposed. So we have these five images. So the key to this is we want to bring these into Photoshop and we want to simply stack them as layers in an empty image, in an empty, uh, uh, a, new, a new blank image. The easiest way to do that, and the reason we're using the uh, bridge to do it, is if you go up into bridge and you click on tools and come down to Photoshop, and I'm in CS6 here, by the way, but this also applies to at least CS three, four, five, and six, I think. And I'm going to say uh, merge to HDR Pro, okay? And when we do that, Photoshop is, you see, it looks like it's doing the same thing. It's creating the five layers. It's stacking them over in the layers palette, all right? Now it's aligning. This is the important step because I shot these without a, tri without a tripod. These are just handheld. So it's important to align them. So it does a pretty good job of aligning. All right, so it comes in. This is the HDR Pro window in Photoshop. And um, you're probably, by default, this is what the 32-bit window looks like, okay? There's also a 16-bit window, and then there's an 8-bit window. And by default, I think Photoshop comes into the 16-bit window. So you get this set of controls. 
And you can do things here like uh, edge glow. You can change the radius to strength. You have uh, uh, tone and detail commands. There's a nice detail slider and, and exposure and gamma. And there's also a curves down here. You can play with the curve itself. And you can change shadow, highlights, vibrance, and saturation. So this is what, and oh, and there's a bunch of built-in in the newer versions of Photoshop. There's a drop-down menu here that says, there's a default setting, but if you want this to look, uh, we want it to look photorealistic, but if I wanted it to look surrealistic, you click on that, that sort of does an instant, you know, surreal version of it, okay? Um, and there's all kinds of variations in between. The photorealistic one, yeah, kind of dull. Uh, and the default one, okay? So you, traditionally what happens is people would get, get it in this form. They would, you know, either do something with it here or just say, you know, okay. And then they might take the resulting image and maybe, you know, try to manipulate it in the, the main part of Photoshop. Um, what's, what I'm suggesting you do here, if, particularly if you want photorealistic looking stuff, is go up to the 32-bit version, 32-bit drop-down, all right? And also check the box that says remove ghost, because if something moves in the five exposures, okay, you, if it's like a, a tree branch moving across itself, it'll give you a ghost image. We don't want that typically. So what we do is it gives us the opportunity to go down at the bottom here, look at the five images we have, and take, go through and look at them and say which one, you know, do we see any ghosting and which one of the five gives us the least amount of ghosting. It makes a guess. And you see it's, it's picked the, the ones, it's, it's picked this image right here, the uh, minus one uh, f-stop exposure, uh, is, which it thinks is the, the best without ghost. But, for example, if I click on one of these other ones, you can see if you watch the appearance changes a bit from one to the other. Okay. And the cleanest of them is probably that one there. All right. Now this is an image that probably didn't really need HDR, but it is a you know a sheet of white paper basically in a fairly high contrast lighting condition. And you know, we want the blacks to pop, we want the whites to pop, but we don't want to blow out anything that we don't have to. The interesting thing in 32-bit here is you can see you have a slider over here that basically if you move it in that direction, it basically shifts. It shows you you've got that much tonal range in that direction to work with, and in the other direction, you've got a lot to work with, okay? And it doesn't really matter where this is. You usually just leave it wherever you want because it, it doesn't – this is 32-bit, and your monitor doesn't read 32-bit. At least most of them don't. So it doesn't really matter where that's set at the moment. But what I do with it is that we just – okay, so we took our five images. We popped it into Photoshop, let the Photoshop HDR program put them together, and now we're just going to say okay to it. And that brings us back into the main part of Photoshop in a minute. Okay. And at this point, I'm not going to do anything except I'm going to uh, save it. And I'm going to say File, Save As. And instead of saving it as a PSD, we're going to drop it down and change it to TIFF. Okay, and we're going to give it a name. Uh, let me call it uh, 9 so I don't get it confused with anything else. Okay, and, um, and I'm going to say save. And it gives me the choice here. Let's see, a TIFF can be saved as 16-bit, 24-bit, 32-bit, which is nice. You can do compression or not. You can set the, the bit order for uh, PC or Macintosh. I really don't know if that matters, does it? I don't think it, it does, but yeah. Uh, anyway, so anyway, so we're leaving it at 32-bit. One of the bad things about a 32-bit image is if you look at it in fast stone, it just sort of looks like a gray scale. It's just gray. <laughs> it doesn't show you the image because fast stone can't handle 32-bit. It can handle 16, but not 32. Okay, so basically we we saved it. All right, so now I'm going to go back to the bridge and hopefully I hope it saved it to the same folder. Uh, let's see if we find it. Slider. Yeah, there it is. Untitled. Okay. So that's it right there. All right. Now, kind of doesn't look too good, right? <laughs> but we don't worry about that. All right. So now the deal is I want to open it and I want to open it in Camera Raw. I could have been in Lightroom and opened it in Lightroom, which is the same thing as Camera Raw. All right. So I'm just going to right click on it. Oops. There we go. Uh, no. Uh, I'm going to open in Camera Raw here. 
Okay, it flips over to camera raw. Now, why did we do this? The reason we did this is if you look at the exposure slider here, if you look at the exposure slider for your 8-bit or 16-bit images, what you'll find out is if you run the, the exposure starts in the middle at zero, if you run it all the way up in this direction, it goes plus five and it goes minus five. When you go to a 32-bit image, it goes up to plus 10 f-stops and minus 10 f-stops. You got 20 f-stops worth of exposure range to find one that works for you, okay? So it basically, a lot of latitude here. So then you just sort of pick, you know, one that looks good to you and then decide what you want. Just process it from this point on. Just process it as though it's a regular image, okay? So uh, basically, and I'm just walk, looking at the histogram and just trying to, you know, just trying to get the histogram to fit within the, 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 the left and right side of the, histo hi the histogram. Uh, I like a contrasty image, so we can pop the contrast a little bit. Um, and uh, we can play with the highlights a little bit. I sure want to bring them to about there. Um, the shadows, we can open up a little. The whites, do we need to pop it at all? A little bit. Uh, take the blacks and bring them down a bit to give us a, lot, so a richer black, basically. Um, do white balance, probably needs to tweak the white balance. This gets a little tricky on an overexposed image, by the way. There it goes. Okay, you see that got rid of the little yeah. I had shot this at home under a mix of one tungsten lamp across the room and one of these compact fluorescents sort of shooting over my shoulder. So, yeah, I set it on, I think I had it set for tungsten white balance when I took the picture. So it, it's not too bad, but uh, it needed correction. All right, so now your whites are white, at least they're pretty close. They're, they're white on my screen. <laughs> okay. Now, basically, we just, at this point, we uh, pop the clarity if we want, get us, get us a nice sharp picture. We can bring up the vibrance if we want a bit. Okay, tweak the saturation a little. All right, and basically, you end up with a nice picture out of it. Okay? Um, now, admittedly, this wasn't a scene that had a lot of, you know, it, it, it wasn't a really challenging scene to shoot initially <clears throat> because it didn't have a, a gross... Uh, dynamic range to it. But if we were shooting outdoors at noon with my little camera, you would have seen, you know, totally washed out skies you couldn't recover. And, and of course, you people know I only shoot in JPEG. Yeah. <laughs> so if you shoot in RAW, you get an extra one F stop, one and a half F stops of overexposure to try to correct. Um, although it doesn't correct as well as it ought to, but it, it, you got a shot at it. But in any case, um, so this, this technique works for JPEGs, it works for RAW. Uh, it works for if you want to do seven, you know, f-stop exposure bracket, or if you want to do five, no problem. Mm -hmm. So very just a very little simple thing, and and the idea here is you don't necessarily even have to if you're going through Photoshop's um, auto align feature, which it uses to to set up the images and correct the, the alignment. You don't even need to use a tripod to do this. You can just handheld. This was handheld. Yeah, and you know, it's not that big a deal, right? And I, I know when I've tried it through Photomatics or whatever, I've never been able to do it without using a tripod. It, they say the auto alignment works pretty well. The, the NIC HDR program, I think, is better than the Photomatics in terms of alignment. Still not as, still not, nothing touches Photoshop, particularly CS6. Okay? So, okay, yes. In the middle, like, is that a battery company? Um, you know, <laughs> I'm looking. I, 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 bought, I bought a new camera. Hey! Okay? Hey! For, for the last eight years, I had this little Konica Minolta A200, which I love, but the sensor is about the size of my fingernail. And it's got a problem. In that, I mean, it's a beautiful camera. It's light. It does everything I want, except it's got a lot of noise, particularly in low-light situations. And it gives white skies when you shoot anything, blue skies. So after eight years of looking and looking and looking and looking, I finally bought that new Olympus that came out. So this is actually shot with the new Olympus. However, I do have, from the old days, an old Spiritone radio transmitter, okay? And it turns out that they actually make, they still make a cable that goes from the Spiritone receiver that will plug into now the USB port of the, uh, the new Olympus camera so that I can trigger that camera with that old receiver. So all I need is a second. I have one 9-volt battery. i got to go find another one for the trigger, for the clicker. But I have a, basically a, a nice little radio clicker that works fine. 
unless a, a truck drives by and uses a CB radio, then it fires too. But <laughs> okay, but it's really neat, you know. So a piece of equipment I used 40 years ago for film, you know, is still usable today with the new with the new uh, camera. Um, the other thing I found, by the way, if you ever consider buying uh, the Olympus, I think two of the of the Nikons use the same plug that the Olympus uses. They sell a, Olympus sells a little remote, you know, with a cord that you plug in, and they sell it for fifty six dollars, something like that. Um, you can get a seven dollar one that works just fine. Okay, you couldn't tell the difference, so don't spend that kind of money. Um, anyway. All right, so that's my first tip, a very simple tip, not much to it, but the idea is think in mind, you know, that if you are into this HDR situation and you like realistic looking HDR, I suppose, if you want, you know, you, don't, you want the surreal HDR, just continue straight in with Photoshop and pick one of those defaults and play with all those sliders and you can get something that's uh, pretty creative. But if you just want it to come out looking like a normal picture that has a full set of tonal range, this is a, a nice, simple way of doing it. You don't have to worry about tripods or anything like that. Okay? All right. So let me cancel that. Or let me just say done to that. All right. Um, let me go back to part two. Tip number two. Ah, flower pictures. Okay? Here's the deal. There's this great little feature in Photoshop called Auto Blend. All right? Hmm? No, this is in <coughs> CS5, CS4. Is it in CS3, Auto Blend? When did they introduce it? It goes back a ways. Okay. Anyway, what Auto Blend does, what Auto Blend does is if you take several pictures, take two pictures, okay, and you, you basically select, you, you stack the two pictures as layers, and you select both of them and you run it through Auto Blend, and what it does is if there's a sharp area in a picture, and in the other picture, that area is not as sharp, it uses the sharp part. If in the first picture, you know, it's the opposite way around, it uses the sharp part. So if you have a bunch of pictures that have mm, something sharp, something's fuzzy, when you put them all together, it tries to make the sharpest possible picture as it can by taking pieces from one spot or the other. Is this in file automate? Hmm? Is this in file automate? Where is auto blend? Auto blend is under it's under edit. It's, it's right right below auto align. It's called auto blend. Okay. Now the deal is where is this useful to us? Okay, think about this. I I I should I used to shoot a lot of flowers. I still shoot quite a few flowers. Let me go. Let me find you some flowers. Uh, I need a program to do that. Let's try fast stone. And let's do flowers. Okay. Well, in fact, let's even even in scenery, okay, if you go to something simple like that, all right, again, I can have this little camera that has incredible depth of field, right? Small sensor means that if, if you were talking a full-frame camera, magnification factor of one, okay, uh, and you set it at f4, okay, at f4 and you photograph a scene like this, f4 is not going to give you enough depth of field to cover the entire scene. Right? So you're going to have to select, do you want the foreground to be in focus? Do you want the middle ground to be in focus? Do you want the background to be in focus? All right. So what choices do you have? Well, you could stop it down to F22. Okay. But if you stop it down to F22, now your shutter speed gets very long. Okay. You can compensate for that by increasing the ISO, but then your, your shutter speed is normal, but now you got a noisy picture. Okay. So you're sort of, you know, hurting yourself basically by having to use that F22. Now, it would be really nice here if instead, let's say you shot a series of pictures and you shot them basically wide open. You keep the lens at, at uh, F4, keep it at, at F18 if, you, if you've got an F18 lens. And you basically lock in your, your shutter speed, lock in your ISO, lock in your aperture, yeah, whatever you're and your aperture you want, you use wide open, okay? And basically, set your focus point for, can you guys see my cursor? Is there a cursor showing up when I do that? Um, anyway, if you, if you go to the foreground leaves and you focus on that and you take a picture, and then you don't move the camera or anything, hopefully you're, it'd be nice if you're on a tripod, but, but at least if you're, if you're hand holding, at least try to be consistent. Then move back a little bit further in the picture and take another, another shot. Go back further, take 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 another shot. 
So now when you look at it, these individual pictures, you know, in the first picture, the foreground is going to be nice and sharp. Everything else is going to be fuzzy. In the middle, we go to the middle ground picture, that's going to be sharp, but the foreground is going to be out of focus. The background is going to be out of focus. And obviously when you go to the background, it's going to be sharp. All the foreground and middle ground is going to be out of focus. You take that whole series of pictures, you stack them as layers in Photoshop, you run auto align on them, first of all, so that you don't have to use a tripod. Then you run auto blend, and what it does is it makes the whole picture sharp. Okay? So you manage to get away shooting a sharp picture without having, and shooting it at a short shutter speed, all right, which is nice. And as long as, the only thing that hurts you here is if, you know, the leaves are blowing in the, in the uh, wind. So again, but of course that's the same problem at F22, right? If the leaves are blowing in the wind, you got the same problem. So there's a lot of advantages to doing this. You know, in the old days we would have never done it in film days because, you know, it costs money for all those pictures. But in digital, it doesn't cost us anything. So why not shoot, you know, 10 pictures for every picture at variable depths? We have that, what's that new camera that the, the guy in California, uh, you know, it's got that little fun gamma that everything's in focus at once, you know, or you, you focus it as you need it. The computer focuses it. It's, think of that kind of technology, but this is sort of a simpler version of it that works pretty well. So, yes. Yeah, Helicon does, yes, Helicon does, uh, the plugin for Helicon does have that ability to do that, yes. Is there an anti-ghost in any of this? You, it, it, it's going to add a layer mass, so you can pick and choose if you have to. Yeah. Um, okay. Same thing applies here. Same situation. You know, you got foreground bush, you got a middle ground, you got some background. Again, my little camera. Like I said, I, I started to tell you, if you shoot at f4 with your DSLR, all right. When I go to that little tiny sensor in my camera, there's a factor of four. Your the depth of field you get that that um, I'm sorry. If you go to f16 on your camera to give you good depth of field. If I go to F4 on my camera, I get the same depth of field that you get at F16. So the little cam and that, that's good. That's great for this kind of a picture. It's terrible for shooting portraits where you don't, you know, <laughs> you want to see nice bokeh and you want to see narrow depth of field. And the damn camera, you know, starts at, uh, at well, actually the camera's not bad. It starts at F28. But, but even at F28, you know, 90% of the scene is in focus, which hmm, isn't good for that little camera. But so... Again, this, these techniques are things that I ended up using because I had this little camera that was kind of funky, you know, compared to, to a, quote, a real camera. Yeah. So, uh, okay, flowers is the obvious application of this. Because what do we do with flowers? We go, the, the ideal situation is we go to the flower, the, 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 the botanical garden, there's this nice bed of flowers, you know, we walk up to the first row of flowers sticking out, we set up the tripod, we get, you know, so far away, we... Play with our f-stop so that we try to get the front pedal of the flower in focus. We try to get the back pedal in focus. We want the background to go soft. Well, if there's a good distance between the flower and the background, you can do that by controlling depth of field. Okay? But in most cases, in these flower beds, you know, the vegetation's right up almost against the back of the flower. So if you stop down enough, your, your f-stop down enough to give you a good depth of field, what happens is the background starts to come in focus way too much. And so then you still got to take the picture, go into Photoshop, and blur out the background, okay? And in fact, the new version of Photoshop has tools for doing that. They have now a new blur feature called Iris Blur, which allows you basically to put an oval over the flower, control how the, the depth of field falls away to the edge of the oval, and then everything goes out of focus in the background. And you can even adjust the bokeh and the color of the bokeh, which is kind of neat. Yeah. So <laughs> they're getting pretty sophisticated. But for us in the old days, and these were all film shots from the old days, sort of, you know, you liked, you want the flower to stand out. You, the, veg, the background almost never helps you in most flower pictures, right? So you get a nice flower picture, you get a terrible background. Uh, even in something like a water lily picture, it, you still, there's too much background. And when you have multiple flowers, that's all killer. Focus on one, get enough depth of field to cover this, but you're soft by the time you get out here. You're getting softer, but they're still distracting, you know. It's always in that never-never land for you. So what we need is, like we said, what we need is a, a technique to allow us to go in and very narrowly pick out areas of focus and then stack those focus areas together and to give us exactly what we're looking for, okay. I mean, even in a, in a shot like this, you know, you, I want this to be much more blurry. I like a little bit of detail on the tree here, but I definitely want the flower, including the back petals here, to be sharp. Okay? And, you know, killer here, background, terrible. Yeah. 
So nice flowers, terrible backgrounds is really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely not. Well, I presume be the RAM size of your computer, but that's not an issue in, for most of us these days. Okay. All right. So anyway, so that's the, the approach. Now the problem is because I do this from film days, I threw out all those out of focus ones. So I only have <laughs> there is the end picture. So um, I have to use a, I can't use a flower to show you as an example. So I had to set up a flower on my desktop. Okay. And it doesn't look like a flower, but hey, what the hell. Uh, okay. So what I did is, let's see if I can find them. Uh, it's the purple ones. Okay. So I got four pictures I shot. All right, and um, let me just bring these in. Now, these I am going to stack. I'm not going to send them to HDR. So I selected the four, and I'm back in the browser. I selected the four. I go up to Tools. I come down to Photoshop. Now I do come down to Load Files into Photoshop Layers. All right. Okay, and that's the stack, and this is the old HDR one we were playing with before. So let me get rid of that. Okay, so if I look at these from the top down, let me blow this up so you can see it. Okay, in this first picture, the, for the top layer, you see I focused in the foreground. So this is in focus. By the time we get back to Kodak and in the text, you see we're going out of focus. By the time we get back to the second memory card, we're out of focus, and the background's out of focus. All right. So that's that's picture number one. Okay. Picture number two, I focused on I think the O of Kodak. All right. And so the idea is we're just starting to get soft in the foreground one. Where we got an area, if you look at the the writing, you can see it easier, that we got a, a very narrow range here of what's in focus. And then it's slowly going out of focus as we go back. We go to the next layer down and now the foreground is obviously out of focus. The middle ground is out of focus. The memory card here, when I focused on the memory card, is in focus. And the background mm, is starting to go out. All right. And if I look at the fourth one, where I think I focus back here on, I think I focus on the word memory. Now, this is starting to get fuzzy. The Kodak is definitely fuzzy, and our card here is fuzzy. Okay? So, now the deal is, if this were, a, well, all right, in a situation, I can make all of these come into focus. So let me show you that first. All I have to do is I turn on all the eyes for the layers, so we're looking at all of them. I have to select the four layers, okay, so that's just click on the first one and shift click on the last and it, it, it selects all four. Take, just take those four layers and simply go over and run, um, under edit, run auto blend layers. But, okay, so this is just auto blend layers. And now, see, you give two choices for the blend method. You can blend them into a panorama or you can blend them into stacked images. So we want stacked images, and we want a seamless tones and colors. So we check that box. So now we say, okay. I'll get there eventually, folks. The problem is, see, the images all look alike. Yeah. Okay? So as you can see, it took those four images, basically, and the front image is sharp. The middle image is sharp, the back image is sharp, and the background sharp. Okay, so it basically took you know it, it, each of the images only had you know basically one quarter of the image sharp and, and, and three quarters unsharp, and when you blend them together, it gives you that sharp area. <clears throat> now, how do we use this in the case of a flower? Okay, in the case of a flower, let's say we have to we have to guess what a, what a flower is here. So let's say that the the, the, the memory card is the front petal of a flower. And the center of the flower is like right in here, and the Kodak is the back petal of the flower. And the set, this memory card is our background, which is too close, you know, our vegetation, which is coming too close to us. Okay? So all we have to do is, let me run this back before the blend step. So we've auto-aligned, okay? And now what I want to do is the first, the top layer was the foreground layer being sharp. We want to use that layer. The second layer was the Kodak one being sharp, so we want to use that. These other two I'm going to actually turn off and unselect. So I'm just going to make sure I've selected these top two layers. Okay? And, um, but I have to, actually I have to leave these two turned on, I think. 
think I got this right. All right, and now I run auto blend again. And we tell it to stack the images. Aha, okay. And you see what we got here when I blow it up is the first, our, the front petal of our flower is sharp. We come through here to Kodak, our back petal, that's sharp. But see, now our background, we can let that go soft on us, okay? So, if you, now I only did this with taking four points, but if you took, you know, 10 images and moved the focus point, you know, use your, you know, your smallest little spot focus point for, auto, for, for the focusing and just step your way from front to back in this image, you know, you've got a lot to play with here, all right? And it's, it's a powerful technique, really, because, like I said, it allows you, when you're out in the field shooting the flower pictures, instead of having to shoot at f22 and get a long exposure, which is going to blow in that windy day anyway, you get to shoot at a much shorter exposure, okay? And basically, you know, you get to control it all. You don't really need a tripod. You can do, I did this without a tripod. You can do it with a flower if you... You just got to, you, the key of doing any of this without a tripod is pick, pick something in the image and mentally know where it is, and then so you can always line it up, right? And that works like a charm when you do that, all right? Yes? Well, I wouldn't say obsolete, but it's certainly, yeah, I mean, you're not going to find me carrying a 4 by 5 in the woods on a, tri on a wooden tripod. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very powerful, and, and there's a lot of application. You can use this from, from you know, it, it even works with bugs and that if the bugs aren't moving too fast. And, you know, uh, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of applications for something like this. It's, it's, it's actually a pretty decent little technique. Okay. Well, yeah, I think that would happen here, too. If you, you know, it, it's blending two things, and if there's no sharp area, you know, in that, between, you know, area one and area two, if there's a little fuzzy area in between it where they're not overlapping, yeah, you're definitely going to see a softness there, okay? All right? All right, so that was tip number two, along with half of tip number three. I'm going to get back to tip number three here. Uh, okay, let me get back. Okay. So that was using auto blend to control depth of field. All right, as I said, it's an alternative to shooting all in focus and then blurring the background. Oh yeah, and uh, I, I may do that if we still have time. But if, if you haven't seen that that iris blur in Photoshop, it 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 literally in the old days what we used to do is shoot everything sharp f22, and then we basically took it into Photoshop and we made you know selected carefully the flower, put it on its own layer, took the what was left behind cloned in the colors around the, the flower into the flower a bit because when you blur it tends to expand in all directions. And then we blurred the bat the original background layer and we had a sharp layer sitting on top of it. That's the technique we used to win competitions back in the old days. <laughs> okay. Iris blur makes it a lot easier now. Anyway, I'll come back to that. All right, I want to talk about image stacking because this one's cute. This one's even better because, okay, this is, this is your waterfall picture, okay? You're, you go out in the middle of the day, you know, you're, you're on vacation, you see this beautiful waterfall, or there's this beautiful river with rapids, you know, white water coming down, and you want to get that silky look to the water, right? We, we want to use that slow shutter speed, that one-fifth of a second, one-quarter of a second shutter speed to get the water to be nice and silky looking. But we, and we want, of course, you know, everything around it to be tack sharp. Uh, okay, so we put the camera on a tripod. We basically set the ISO, because we know we want a long exposure, so we bring the ISO down to the lowest cell setting you have, 100, 100, 200, 300, whatever your camera will do. We basically hit stop down to F22 because we need to slow down that damn shutter speed because we're out in the middle of the day and it doesn't want to be six seconds shutter speed. So then we add a, a polarizer to it, we add a neutral density filter to it. We borrow a, our friend's neutral density filter to stack on top of it. We buy one of the, what's the one that's got eight, eight gradations of neutral density, you know? We put whatever, we throw everything we can on this damn thing to get a one-sixth of a second exposure out of it in the middle of the day, all right? So, all right. So, some cameras now do multiple exposures, and they'll do multiple, multiple exposures. I, I, this new camera I bought only does two. I can, you know, in the camera, I can, I can expose two frames on top of each other. 
I think is a cannon or is got can do like I don't know if it's any infinite number, but they can do a lot. I think you could do like 20 if you wanted. Mm -hmm. So here's the, the alternative to using this long, slow shutter speed is to just you know look at the scene and say if I were shooting this, not worried about slowing down the water, if I'm just going to take a picture, yeah, I'm going to shoot it at f f100 say, or ISO 100. I'm going to shoot it at maybe I only need like f8 or whatever to give me the depth of field I want. And my shutter speed is going to be one five hundredth of a second. Terrific. Okay. The good news is that you don't have to worry about you know birds flying through, people walking through if it's a five hundredth of a second. So what you do again, put the camera on a tripod if you got it, or hand hold it carefully, and basically set everything up for the one five hundredth of a second shutter speed, and just take twenty pictures. Okay. So. Basically, you just take 20 pictures of, you know, a second or two apart, whatever, or if you want, or even, you know, as fast as you think, if you have a, a camera that shoots only two frames a second, just, you know, put it in continuous mode and burst. Um, so anyway, you end up with, say, 20 pictures. Now, think about it. What's different in the pictures? Well, the things that aren't moving are identical in every picture, okay? The things that are moving are moving in each frame. So if we can use the stacking mode in Photoshop to go in with that smart filter and do the math on it, we can average out the things that moved in the picture. So our sharp little water droplets turn into a nice silky curtain of water if you do it properly. Okay? So I got to, and again, I didn't, I didn't have an example. I, I mean, I, I did the same thing. I had all kinds of waterfall pictures shot over slightly different exposures, but not enough to really, I mean, I showed you the effect, but not as good as these guys. So I'm going to play a little video here where uh, basically... Uh, I think it was, R is it RC? Um, RC Concepcion from the Scott Kelby group um, is using the same thing, basically, to give him the silky water from multiple exposures. Like he did about 25 exposures, I think. So let me see if I can bring this up. This came from D-Town TV. I'm going to talk next week about podcasts that you can get for free on the Internet, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this is one of the, this is one of the podcasts from, um, that you can get for free from the Internet. And I'm going to start in the middle. By the way, he's playing with the new little Olympus. This guy's got no clue. DSL people that have never touched an electronic viewfinder got no idea about the concept of a mirrorless camera. Yeah, they just don't know what they look at it and they go, what do we do with it? You look through it? I mean, just a viewfinder? The panel pulls out? And the, the picture? You see the picture on the back before you take it? What's that all about? They don't know. Yeah. But anyway, for those of us who do know and have come from the toy cameras, uh, it's a different. Anyway, so this is his. They're going to break into this in a second as soon as I get a photo unit here. and the feel of it. And uh, swing on by Larry'sCheapShots.com and you'll see an article about EVFs and then some other stuff uh, coming up next week Oops, when nice. we talk about the mirrorless. Very cameras. cool. Hey, can I show you something? Yeah, yeah, uh, let's um, do this. Now, this is something that I was thinking. I was going to add it to the first part of the tip, but then I figured I'd kind of set it up to not waste any time. But remember when I was showing you guys these pictures? I showed you these pictures that were the exact right, the same separates. shots, the exact same shots that were one on top of the other, right? Don't worry about my, don't worry Those about Those are the sharp pictures. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it's one is the exact same shot, exact same shot, right? What I did was in Photoshop, when you're in Photoshop, you can go into File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. And what that does is it lets you take a series of files and put them all into one layer. Mm -hmm. So all I did is I selected all of those files, and that's what it looks like here, right? So they're all the exact same file. Okay. Right? Now, once I have that done, all I did was go to Layer, select all the files, and then convert to smart object, right? So now, all of those files are right here in this file as a smart object. Okay. Right? Once you have them all as a smart object, layer, smart objects, stack mode, and you select mean. Okay. Watch. Right? So now it takes the, st the stack mode of all of those images that sit in a smart object and averages them out, and this is what you get. Isn't that cool? Very cool. So if your camera doesn't have right. multiple exposure, just take the same exposure over and over and over, and you can rely on Photoshop to do all of that stuff for you. Okay, and this is this is available in earlier versions of Photoshop as well. Right. So not bad. Very cool. RC, you you. I was thinking about that. I was like, I got. Okay. So, I, isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. So I like that one. So. Um, but you can extend this because we used to do this back in, again back in film days with. I actually did it with version 5 of Photoshop, not CS5, version 5. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Let me get out of here first of all. Let me figure out how to get out of here without us killing us here. All right. Okay. And let me minimize that. And let me come back up to. Let's go back up into bridge. And um, let's see. Let me go to waterfalls. Yeah, so I had a whole bunch of these I tried it on, and let's see if I can find one that almost looked like it worked. Let's see, it's not that one. Oops. Yep. Yes, I'm going to show you that next, hopefully. Let's see, so that's one, that's two, that's three. Hmm. It's the hard part is trying to find anything here. Uh, okay, I guess I could do that one. Okay, so I've got, uh, let's see, that picture, that picture, that picture, that picture. Okay, so I've got six of these. Now, the problem is that all of these, if I look at these individually, uh, you see my shutter speed is a 15th of a second, a 60th of a second on that one, a 30th of a second, a 15th, a 15th. So let's just take the ones that have the... Uh... Yes. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the only, basically, the, it's just a matter of time. You're just basically taking the same picture at, at time. Everything. Everything's the same except for the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to take the I'm going to take the one sixtieth of a second one. Uh, that's the thirtieth of a second. That's the fifteenth. Let me take those three pictures. All right. And again, uh, we want to put them into a stack. Okay. So we come back under Tools, under Photoshop, under Load Files, into Photoshop Layers. Okay, now obviously again no tripod and I'm moving around taking these pictures so I didn't really have any attempt here to line these up. So I'm going to select the three the three layers and I'm going to go up to edit and go to auto align layers. Put it on auto, say okay, give it a chance. I see there, you can see from the white there that I missed a little bit. All right, uh, at this stage I could actually crop it to get rid of that junk. By the way, this is the new crop tool in CS6. If you haven't seen it, it's very similar to what's in Lightroom now. Uh, makes it a lot easier. I think it makes it a lot easier to crop than the O tool. Well, for one thing, it gives you the, the rule of thirds thing built in, which is nice. And um, you can also rotate it. You know, there's a ro I can rotate the picture and do all kinds of good stuff with it. All right. Okay. So those are those are our, our three layers. Okay. Now at this point, I'm going to convert it into a smart object. So I have the three layers selected. I right click. I say convert to smart object. Once I've got it as a smart object, I go up to layer, come down to smart objects, come down to stack mode, come down to mean. Okay. And you see what it did? Okay. And if I, let's see if I can save this and make it look decent. Uh, I'm going to say file, save as. And I'm going to call it, uh, I better call it Dick. Uh, and I can make it a JPEG. There's no reason not to. Um, and uh, I want to put it in a waterfall folder. Okay. And save it. Okay, now let's see if I can figure out what I need. I need to know the numbers of these. 1277, okay. Now I guess got to find 1277. So it's that picture and these two pictures. And this is the one I just created, Dick. And if we look at them side by side. And 
and minimize this. Okay, so this is the this, the the result of the the average of the three. Those are the individual pictures there. Okay, now it's not a huge difference because they were so close to start with. But you can see there's more detail here, blah, 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 and there's more of a curtainy effect to the water over here, particularly, particularly up over here. Um, one, of the problems, one of the problems of doing this, though, is if the vegetation moved, and you can see if you look at the vegetation sticking in here, okay, when we average that vegetation, we got a problem. <laughs> and, and now if that, this is a result of me having walked around a little bit with the camera. Now, if you had it on a tripod and you didn't have any wind, you wouldn't have that problem. Um, but in my case, I, as I did them, I didn't did it a little sloppy. Okay. So anyway, so it works. Okay, it works on the video. It works here. All right. So what else can you use this for? All right. Well, one of the things you can use it for is um, let's see. Um, let me go into back over to the bridge. Okay. One of the things we can do is, I took a picture, I had the camera set up in my window. My, this is my real old Damage 7, huh? 6 megapixel, something like that, 5 megapixel camera, I think. I had that set up in a window on a tripod, and the moon was rising, and I was shooting through some trees, and I wanted to record, you know, a sequence of the moon here, the moon here, the moon here, the moon here, the moon here. Okay. So, that's, I, I uh, and actually that little shitty camera had an intervalometer on it built in, which is the only reason I was doing this, right? You know, because it was there, you had to try it. So if you look, if you go through the sequence of pictures, you see the moon is rising and it's, you're not getting a clear moon because it's passing some trees in the foreground. But anyway, if I take this stack of, this set of pictures, bring it over to the end, and at the end, I think I even want to include, let's see, I want to include that last picture, which is my scenery. I took one picture before the moon came up with a little bit better exposure. All right, so I have this whole bunch of pictures, so we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna to go to Tools, we're gonna to come down to Photoshop, we're gonna come down to Load Files into Photoshop Layers. That was the background picture. Okay, and let me get rid of the scenery picture. Okay, so same situation here. Um, basically, I want to select all the layers. Um, do I want to auto align? I have to think about that. Probably do. Oh, well, they're on a tripod, so I shouldn't have to. So I'm going to not do the auto align here just in case it gives me trouble. Okay, so I'm going to right click and I'm going to say convert to a smart object. And I'm going to go up to layer. And I'm going to come down to Smart Object, Stack Mode, and do the mean. It no, no, it, it 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 could confuse it a bit, so I didn't want to chance it. Okay, so all right, so there's a picture, but you can barely see it. You see, it got a little dull. So let's now, so let's do some Photoshop on it. So all we have to do here is, uh, let's see, let's go to adjustment level, let's just, you can see all our data is dark. So we're going to just run the, uh, run it all the way over. Okay, we're going to do it one more time, because why not? It's Photoshop, you can do whatever you want. Remember Bob Ross, he used to do the painting? You know, it's your world, do it however you want it. Love it. I, I've got a squirrel in the backyard. How do you like that squirrel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, actually I shot, uh, there's four actual pictures between each one of these moons. I had a, you know, I, I had it on a, I don't know how many, like, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, maybe it was a minute, I don't remember, it was many years ago that I shot this. But, and I actually, threw, you know, I, I basically just went in and took out the pictures that, that weren't overlapping. Yeah. Um, a little trial and error has to be, or, you know, has to be a little, little effort there. Okay, so you have that. Um, all right, so I've done that to it. The color is not particularly great. Uh, let us do a couple of things. One is, let me crop it, because again, I don't need most of this. 
Okay, and in fact, I'm going to crop it all the way in there and crop it down about there. You know, maybe crop it up a little bit. Okay, and all right. And then I want to do a white balance on this uh, because I don't like the color. Um, I don't remember what I had it set for, frankly. I probably had it set for cloudy, but it was sticking out the window, and there's outdoor lighting, which is why these trees are lit up at all. There's uh, my building has some, you know, some security lights down around the, the base of the building. Okay, so what I want to do at this point is let me let me do what? Let me add another adjustment layer. I'm going to do another adjustment layer for levels. Just so that I can get the eyedropper, I'm going to just take the middle eyedropper and go into there. And ah, there you go, that's better. I like that color better. Okay. And um, all right. Now, to, what bothers me is the moon is a little too white. Okay. So let's add a let's put a filter over it. Photo filter. There you go. Nice warming filter. Just just watching just the moon to see how bright I want the moon to be. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, and now I'm going to click on the mask and I'm going to do a control I to invert the mask from a white mask to a black mask. And I'm going to get white as my foreground color and get a paintbrush and get the right size moon and just go in and paint yellow on the moon. Okay, and let's see what else can we do to it? Maybe add a little brightness, add a little contrast. Okay, so you know it's you know it's, it's a little exercise. It's one of those things you can do. If this were an eclipse of the you know of the moon, you you know you we would get the phases. And I if I did a right, I, they don't let me on the roof of the building anymore. Yeah. They locked the roofs you know, for security reasons, but uh, that used to be what I used to do. I'm on a six-story building, this one of the tallest buildings in Mount Kisco. So you go up on the roof, and you just had the whole sky open to you. Yeah. You sit, sit, spend all night up there. Okay. So anyway, so this, so again, this is this is uh, stacking image. You know, it's stacking images is what we're doing here. We're in if the astrophotographers have been doing this for years. One of the things they do is if you have an equatorial mount, you know, so that it tracks the movement of the stars. You basically put a camera on this equatorial mount. You shoot the stars, but the stars are really faint, right? So you got a couple of choices: is you can put it into bulb mode and leave the thing open for you know a half an hour or whatever to build up the image, so you can see the nebula in amongst the stars or whatever. And that's a little, you know, that's doable, but it's a problem with particularly with the digital cameras and the small digital cameras that don't have a huge buffer, because like my camera. I think it'll do 30 minutes in bulb mode at the moment. My other, my little camera only did like 30 seconds in bulb mode. Okay. So what, what you had to do is you had to shoot 30 seconds and then you had to do a dark frame subtraction because it was such a noisy sensor. So what dark frame subtraction is where you take a picture of that last 30 seconds. The camera, after you take that picture, it takes a black frame. It, it basically exposes the sensor for another 30 minutes, but doesn't open the shutter. And it subtracts the noise that it sees in that dark frame away from your image. So it's a way of getting noise out of your image. And, and again, I noticed on this new Olympus camera, I can turn that feature on or off. Okay. Um, and that's a very useful feature at times. Anyway, so, so the deal is if you, had the cam, if you had your camera on an equatorial mount, you, know, um, you could basically use this to just take multiple pictures of the stars and keep building up their brightness level, brightness whatever, so that you would see... You know, even if you're in a light polluted area, you would see eventually that you would end up with a nice dark sky and beautiful stars showing through and all the nebula and the Milky Way and the whole bit. So that's a that's an approach. Now, last Sunday was the Persis meteor shower. OK, so I got calls from people that said, how do I photograph this? So I had to think about this a little bit because it's not as easy as you think. Same problem here is. Um, Let's see if I can come back into this one. And I gotta figure out where I put these. Okay.
All right, I can do this in, let me do this in Fast Stone. Um, okay. So you could go out with your camera, put your camera on a tripod, and you could take a 30 second exposure to try to build up the intensity of the stars. But what's the problem? The problem is the stars are moving. Okay? So I actually wanted to get star trails. So I did a, and I think this is a one tenth of a second or something like that exposure. Okay? And so I did a base exposure. And then what I did is I decided rather than try to do the star trails by leaving the shutter open and you would see the smearing of the stars, again, I could let them smear for, you know, 30 minutes at most. Then it's going to, I don't know if it's going to do the dark frame or not for 30 minutes after, but even if you turn that off, you still have to then stop it and start another exposure. There's a little bit of a gap between the, the star trails. And I said, there's got to be a better way, of doing, an easier way of doing this. And, oh, and by the way, I again went out and I didn't have a tripod. This is handheld, okay? By the way, the image stabilizer works really well in that new camera, <laughs> okay? Um, but this is, that's a tenth of a second handheld at, uh, I think, about 100 millimeter, okay? Um, I'm sorry, what? Yes, that is the Milky Way. Okay, so, okay, so I took, I took this picture. So then I said, well, what happens if I just take 20 pictures handheld at, you know, tenth of a second? So I did. Now the stars are all moving, right? Because I took a picture, I waited a couple of minutes, I took another picture, I waited a couple of minutes, I took another I, I did this over the course of like an hour and a half, all right? So the interesting thing about this is you, you should be able to pick out Polaris. Polaris is the one that doesn't move. Well, in reality, the problem is I had these 20 pictures, and since I didn't bother to use a tripod, I handheld everything. I put, I stacked these in as layers, but then I had to go in. I couldn't use auto align, obviously, because what Al said before, how does, what does it align, right? So I couldn't do that. So what I did is I had to manually align all of these images on Polaris. Okay. So if you blow up Polaris, you can see. Okay. Polaris should be a single, a single star. Can I blow it up? Oops, too far. There it is. And you can see it's uh, I, there's a little <clears throat> a little lopsided star. I didn't do a great accurate job of lining it up, but the result is that the result is that as you can see, each of the stars that each each of those trails is a, is a separate ten second exposure. Uh, I'm sorry, one tenth of a second exposure. Okay, and the little wobbiness is how inaccurately I line things up. All right, but. So I got that, and they said, well, it's not exactly star trails, but it's getting in the right direction. So then what do you do? Well, we have this great little filter in Photoshop called Radio Blur. So I went into Radio Blur, and you just have to set where you want the center of the, the blur, you know, the radio to be. So I just lined it up with Polaris by trial and error, 53 or 4 tries. And when you do that, okay, same data, just converted into, with the Radio Blur into that. Okay? So, you know, Again, you know, I'm just, I had a new camera I was playing. But there's a lot of uses for this. The concept here is don't think you have to necessarily stop everything down to F22 and do a long exposure, you know, or even in the case of here, open wide open and you have to track it with a, what does it cost for an equatorial mount? Several hundred dollars, right? Um, you know, so you can get by with, uh, you can, I mean, if I put it on a tripod, I would have made life a lot easier for myself. But, okay. but you can even get by using hand holding if you have to. So anyway. Fun and games, little things to play with, you know, and um, why not? Yeah. So three tips for tonight. They're all related, but um, uh, they're, they're three powerful techniques. If you combine how you shoot in the field with how you process in the, you know, in Photoshop, you can do some really powerful and different kind of stuff.